random. Hi right, guys, it is a fine spring day. Just the right Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on this lovely, it is Wednesday morning, I believe May 8th. 2020. I am Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles, and this is my little uh, co-pilot, Sancho Panza. And uh, there's still some confusion. So, guys, what is going on with this channel is uh, I am going, this channel is going to limp along, let's see, five more days through Sunday, May 10th, I'm going to uh, wind up uh, two years here on Collapse Chronicles with my interview with uh, Bill Gaty to uh, <coughs> sign off for a little while. And as I have mentioned, I will return when the top 10 stories on the mainstream media, otherwise known as Yahoo News. When I click on Yahoo News and the top 10 stories are not about how many humans are going to die of coronavirus. That is going to be my trigger that this planet has an interest in any other story on the planet then how many humans have died, might die, whatever, of coronavirus. Uh, when, when, when as a planet we can think of something else to talk about. So I, I you know, since I announced this, uh, you know, after the battering that this channel took with uh, subscribers pouring off of this channel, uh, I noticed uh, in the last four days, four days I believe, 58 new subscribers. I have had more subscribers in the last four days than in any four-day history in Collapse Chronicles. I think what it is is subscribers who got in a snit over this how many humans will die uh, from coronavirus, uh, that they've gotten over their snit, they have come back into the fold so they can find uh, stories uh, because they, I guess they figured they really are interested in any other subject on the planet than how many humans have died of coronavirus. And so welcome back. Uh, I'm glad our little uh, whatever, let's declare a truce. Uh, welcome back, and so we're going to think of some other things to talk about. Now today, and probably for the last few of, of these uh, videos, including my <coughs> interview with Bill Gaty, which uh, a lot of it <coughs> is about the uh, coronavirus, or the corona panic is what uh, my interview with Bill is about, not about the coronavirus. Uh, so there are going to be some ties. So uh, today's video is, is going to have uh, obvious connections to the C word. <coughs> but before I get into that, uh, good Lord, six of you have sent me various versions of this story. Uh, this is, I guess, the BBC's version of it about this new study, this new climate change model study pointing out that more than three billion people could live in extreme heat by 2070. In the next 50 years, that more than 3 billion people will be living in, uh, all right, more than 3 billion people will be living in places with, quote, near unlivable temperatures by 2070, according to a new uh, study, unless, uh, unless greenhouse gas emissions fall 
large numbers of people will experience average temperatures hotter than 29 degree Celsius. This is considered outside the climate niche in which humans have thrived for the past 6,000 years. Okay, so 29C. All right, I am uh, one of these uh, strange breed called an American where we still use the Fahrenheit the Fahrenheit scale of temperature, the, you know, the perfectly sensible, you know, that ridiculous, I've never really understood that, that Celsius scale where zero is freezing and uh, 100 is boiling. At zero degrees, water freezes. At 100 degrees, uh, water boils. I, I, I've never understood this. Why would anybody with a brain make zero the freezing point of water and 100 the boiling point when you could just do as Americans do? Obviously, 32 degrees is the freezing point where water freezes at 32 degrees and water boils at 212 degrees. What, what is so hard to understand about this simple logic that zero degrees Fahrenheit is 32 is zero degrees Fahrenheit 32 degrees below the freezing point of water yeah obviously I, I mean don't you get it and that 100 degrees Fahrenheit 100 degrees Fahrenheit is that halfway between anyway uh, uh, obviously uh, th 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 this whole uh, Celsius or centigrade whatever you want to call that C word uh, so anyway, since this, since this is from the BBC and they use that ridiculous antiquated, uh, I had to go over and being an American, I had to make the extra step and find out that 29 degrees is actually comes out to 84, 84.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so 3 billion people by uh, 2070, we'll be living in an average temperature of uh, 80, call it 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I started thinking, okay, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, all right, and now I live in Austin, Texas for about one more month where it has already been uh, how many days right up to triple digits have we already had in Austin, Texas? Now, I am a climate change refugee. Uh, people think I am joking. I am moving to New York because I am a climate change refugee trying to get the hell out of these summers. But uh, right now, Austin, Texas continues to be one of the fastest growing cities in the country, if not the fastest growing. And I'm thinking, okay, 84 degrees average, that means, that, what, another way of saying that is 94 for the high and 74 for the low is an average temperature of 84 degrees. So I go on there and I put in average temperatures for Austin, Texas, in July. And guess what? The average temperature for Austin, Texas in July is 84.5 degrees. In, in July and August in Austin, Texas, and this is the reason I'm leaving Austin, Texas, I admit that I am a, a uh, climate change refugee. Both it is 96 as the, the average high is 96, the average low is 74. 
So what they're saying about this 3 billion people, I'm thinking there might already be 3 billion people living in an unlivable heat zone. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's crap like this that gives uh, Book Hermit, uh, for instance, so much ammunition. Uh, an average temperature of 84 degrees is not, uh, does not kill humans. It makes them miserable. It makes life absolutely miserable. It is no way to live, but it is not, uh, it, you know, this, this nearly unlivable. There, there, there is a real scientific uh, accurate term. It is nearly unlivable. You wish you were dead for months on end. You, you wish you were dead or living in upstate New York. Anyway, enough of this crap. I'm, uh, I've been meaning to do this for a uh, little dog. You can go sit down in your bed. I've been meaning for a long time. Uh, and this is as good a time as any because I have very short-term memory problems. To mention this outfit uh, that I highly encourage you to subscribe to, it is called, you go over there to oilprice.com and you can get their little weekly newsletter for free. They, they have the paid version, but you get the small newsletter called the Oil Price Intelligence Report. And what this is, uh, it is, is just various, uh, it, it's not just about the price of oil, but, but it's an excellent uh, little, uh, just a short, to the point uh, newsletter. And then, of course, you can join the service, to, you know, to get the, uh, the fuller news. So... I just want to introduce you, encourage you to go over to oilprice.com. Uh, it's an excellent source uh, to start down the road of learning about how these uh, oil investors, what this, what this is, is uh, a newsletter for oil investors, obviously, oil and gas investors. Uh, but there is no better place than uh, checking out what our enemies are up to. This is actually comes out of London. Uh, so I'm just going to go over to give you some idea. Now there obviously uh, are some C-word connections in here. All right. In today's newsletter, we will take a quick look at some of the critical figures and data in the energy markets this week. Uh, we will then look at some of the key market movers this week before providing you with the latest analysis of the top news events uh, taking place in the global energy complex over the past few days. Okay, so this is just a hodgepodge. So what they do, obviously, is they start with the price of oil and they divide it between West Texas, Brent, and natural gas. And so what we have seen, uh, this came out yesterday. So this week, over last week, WTI has gone up 350 a barrel, which translates in these prices at 15.36%. So if you had bought in last week, which a lot of people were still buying oil company stocks, you would have made 15% on your investment uh, in, in the last week. Uh, Brent crude uh, tw uh, 336 a barrel. <coughs> uh, to, I'm sorry, the WTI up 352 the price of 26.28 per barrel, which is 15.3% up from last week. Brent crude, which is always a little higher than WTI, 
uh, standing at thirty dollars and fifty six cents yesterday. That is three dollars and thirty six cents per barrel. Otherwise known is up twelve point three percent. And then natural gas at a two dollars and fifteen cents. I think that is based at is it cubic feet or cubic yards? Uh oh anyway <clears throat> two fifteen that is up sixteen cents or an eight point thirteen percent uh increase over the week before. <clears throat> so all oil and gas markets going up, which of course is good news for me since I am selling my property to a fracker. Alright, what is going on with the rig count? Uh, over the past week, uh, there are now, <clears throat> I'm assuming this is the United States. Yeah, this is, this is the U.S., there are now as there are now 325 of these big boy oil rigs pumping which is down 53 per, down 53 rigs uh, just over the last week gas rigs have fallen from 85 to 81 so when you add them up the uh, from 400, there's now 408 uh, oil and gas rigs, which is down 57 for one week. One year ago, today, there were 990. Today, there are 408. And of course, the, the huge crash has been in the last two months. I would say, 95% of that drop in the last two months. And then they actually break it down rigs per basin. All of these oil basins. We're going to look at, uh, at the two big ones. The Eagle Ford total is down to 30. Five of them fell out of Eagle Ford down to 30. And the good old Permian, which is the big boy here in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico, uh, there are now 219 uh, of, the, of these big rigs still pumping oil. And the Permian, well, not so much pumping, I guess, is fracking it. Uh, that is 27 uh, rigs closed up in, uh, in the Permian basis, Basin last week. So if you want to see what that graph looks like, here is the U.S. oil rig count. All right, so what else? Uh, and they do this pretty much every week. Uh, get off of here. Say bye. Good Lord. Oh, I'm at the wrong, uh, all right. Just to give you an idea, that was the chart of the week. Uh, then they show all of these other, uh, <clears throat> petroleum, all these other crashing, uh, charts. All right. So what are some of the top stories <clears throat> this week? U.S. refinery runs have collapsed as demand has declined sharply. And of course, this is the C-word connection. Uh, U.S. refinery runs have collapsed as demand has declined sharply. Ref <coughs> refinery runs... I'm assuming a refinery run is the definition of that is how many, uh, how much oil we have uh, sitting in refineries right now. 
refinery runs fell to 12.8 million barrels per day in the week ending on April 17th, rebounding to 13.2 uh, million barrels per day, but still 21% lower than the five-year average for this time of year. Uh, no, that I, I must have the wrong definition. I'll have to look up the definition of refinery runs because they're rebounding to 13.2 million barrels. Uh, I guess that means the amount of oil moving to U.S. refineries being trucked and piped in has is up to 13.2 million barrels per day, but that's still 21% lower than the five-year average. Okay, and motor gasoline is the obviously the refined product that has been hit the hardest. Gasoline demand fell to 5.1 million barrels per day in April, a 30-year low. We have, uh, but now that since they're opening up the economy, I was noticing driving in to uh, Austin yesterday, you know, they opened up Texas again this weekend, so uh, I noticed a lot more cars on the road uh, yesterday afternoon. You can already tell a big difference as the economy opens up here in Texas. Okay, jet fuel production from refineries declined, declined to 800,000 barrels per day for the week ending on April 24th down 51 percent from the five-year average so I'm, I'm surprised it's still at 800,000 barrels right about one half uh, so there's still plenty of planes in the sky so I guess that means the number of planes has dropped by about half Thanks to uh, the C word. Okay, now we're going to look at market movers. <clears throat> Parsley Energy has suspended all new drilling and fracking. Yes, Parsley cut its spending for the year to below $700 million, with more than half of that already spent. Uh, first quarter production had been up 50 had been up 57 percent year on year but pretty much overnight this big uh, parsley energy killing all new drilling and fracking I uh, marathon petroleum posted a net loss of 9.2 billion dollars in the first quarter. Diamondback Energy said it would curtail its production by 10 to 15 percent. All right, moving on, let's uh, look at some other assorted, uh, let's look at, well obviously oil prices so this is yesterday. Oil prices shot up yesterday on signs of rebounding demand and supply shut-ins. President Donald Trump was notably excited by the news, tweeting the demand was returning. But it may not only be demand that is driving oil prices higher. Uh, DNB analyst held Andre Martinson highlighted that quote, we are currently seeing accelerating oil production curtailments, as we just talked about, outside the OPEC countries. He went on to suggest that the supply side of global oil markets, quote, is about to change quite quickly. All right, next, Bakken, this is, I just mentioned it, the Bakken 
uh, basin output is down 400,000 barrels per day. Roughly a third of North Dakota's oil production has been shut in so far, down 400,000 barrels per day since March. Uh, the Bakken has some of the highest cost of all U.S. shale with an average break-even price of about $46, according to Deutsche Bank. So uh, that is the break-even point, and a lot of people would argue that. Uh, I don't know if that is this $46 is the break-even point with or without federal subsidies. My guess is that is with federal subsidies, uh, and without them it would be a lot uh, higher than $46. Uh, so, you know, when, when oil uh, is, what did we say, is uh, $30 or whatever, guess what? Okay, <clears throat> obviously, as I was noticing uh, yesterday driving to uh, to uh, Austin, Texas, lockdown, you know, all of these economic lockdown easing boost, boosting demand. Data is still scarce since this is just now happening, but the loosening of stay-at-home orders across the world are thought to be boosting demand. Mark Dunner, the co-founder of oil trader Mercuria, said that the oil market has, quote, turned a corner, but if we have a second wave of the pandemic, then all bets are off. All right. Uh, what is going on with the liquid natural gas markets? Chenier Corporation cuts. Chenier cuts its LNG outlook. Chenier Energy said that it expects global liquid natural gas investment to slump this year and next year. The company reiterated its earnings a positive sign. Uh, quote, we are seeing one of the worst LNG markets test Chenier's cash flow durability and so far it's proving to be as resilient as designed. Yep. Uh, okay, what's going on in Canada? Uh, Canadian oil prices rally on supply shut-ins. Canadian oil producers, we're talking the tar sands, were quick to curtail production several weeks ago, several weeks ago, and the price of Western Canada selected, this is yet another oil uh, market price, the Western Canada select, can you say, the tar sands rallied uh, yesterday to nineteen dollars uh, per barrel, sharply narrowing its discount to WTI. Uh, one of these planet eaters, Imperial Oil, cut production this week at its curl K E A R L mine from 220,000 barrels per day to 150,000 barrels per day. Uh, what's going on here in the great state of Texas? Texas kills oil production cuts. After weeks of speculation, these Texas regulators will not vote to order mandatory production cuts in the state of Texas, yes, I bet. Uh, okay, what is the big picture 
the big picture oil shut-ins raise questions. This is Clay Williams, Chief Executive Officer for National Oil Well Varco Incorporated, speaking to Bloomberg, quote, we are on the precipice of forced well shut-ins totaling 15 to 20 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, however, there are still lots of variables regarding the strategy and the economics of widespread shut-ins, including how much production will be lost, which wells to shut down, which to bring online, and the fact that wells may be damaged in the process of shutting them down. Uh, okay, what's going on with those Save the Planet Renewable uh, <clears throat> Energy? U.S. renewables beat coal for 40 days, for a record 40 straight days. <clears throat> Renewable energy has generated more electricity than coal in the United States. Renewables may surpass coal on an annual basis this year for the first time ever. There you go. Next, what's going on with Exxon? Exxon Mobil posts loss. Uh, but kept its dividend intact despite rising financial pressure, the super major posted its first loss in three decades. Uh, yep, Exxon posting its first loss in 30 years. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell and Equinor have cut their dividends. Uh, all right, what's going on in Saudi Arabia? Saudi foreign reserves fall. Saudi Arabia's foreign reserves fell by $24 billion in March, the largest single month decline in at least 20 years. Uh, all right, we have good news from the Keystone XL pipeline. Thanks, I guess, <clears throat> probably something to do with uh, the C word, but uh, this is because of a recent court ruling. Keystone XL pipeline could be delayed by another year. A recent court ruling could delay the XL, the Keystone XL pipeline by another year and the court decision could also affect other pipelines across the country. But we're going to wind up with uh, our, old, our old buddy billionaire Warren Buffett. What does Warren Buffett have to say this week. <clears throat> Warren Buffett regrets his $10 billion Occidental deal. Do you think so? Warren Buffett said he regretted the $10 billion that Berkshire Hathaway put into Occidental Petroleum. <clears throat> Quote, if you are an Occidental shareholder or any shareholder in any oil producing company, you join me in having made a mistake. <laughs> yes, you join me in having made a mistake. But now, of course, if you had, uh, if, if you had invested in the uh, Planet Eaters a week ago, you would have made 15% on your uh, investment in one week. Uh, anyway, guys, I really, if you do want to follow the, this energy stuff, 
I know it takes a little bit of work, but I really do find this oilprice.com to be very accessible. Uh, and uh, so anyway, just trying to educate the masses uh, before I take a vacation, but I need to wrap uh, to wrap this up because I just got a message from my fracker buyer that he is wants to come over and take some measurements. I think he wants to ram a new driveway. <clears throat> this place has been sitting here since 1974 without a driveway and this fracker uh, wants to come start measuring to ram a uh, <clears throat> A driveway across the yard. None of my business <clears throat> what my fracker wants to do with this beautiful yard. Ram a driveway across it to get his gas sucking trucks uh, to the back of the property. Anyway, I need to go deal with my fracker buyer. Bye guys. <clears throat>